Let's turn in the scriptures. Let's release our faith. You know what we're releasing our faith for now? It's for the Lord to speak to us. Right? Not to hear from a man, but to hear from him. You're not limited to what I know. Thank you, Lord. He, uh, we're believing him to speak through me and whoever would be speaking. And we're uh, believing him to speak to us about what was said and beyond what was said to you individually. Turn, please, to uh, John the third chapter, John chapter 3. Then we're going to go over to Romans chapter 8. John 3, Romans 8. Let's release our faith in prayer right now. Father, we thank you for bringing us through another week and every good thing that you've done for us. And we thank you for the privilege of being able to meet together like this. We acknowledge your presence and we say your spirit, your Holy Spirit is our teacher. And we ask you for utterance. I say, Lord, speak through me, beyond me, that we may hear you and not a man. Give all of us ears that hear and eyes that see, a heart that understands. Grant us answers to questions and issues that uh, that we're dealing with right now. Show us the direction for the next steps and next part of your plan, your will. Equip us with a supply of your spirit and anointing and grace and truth that makes us free. And we purpose not to be hearers only, or forgetful hearers, but to be doers of what you say in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You know, uh, Jesus' mother gave them the formula for success at the wedding feast, didn't she? When she told them, whatever he says to you, do it. And they did, and they got miracles. Right? And that's the same thing with us today. If you just do what he says, then you have miracles. John 3, John 3 and 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Is the snake on the pole a type of Jesus on the cross? It is. How can a brass snake be a type of Jesus? Because on the cross, he became sin with our sin and was judged for it there in your place and in mine. Verse 15, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Do you believe in him? Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, this is such a significant thought and truth. Jesus didn't come to show us how sinful we were. Thank you, Lord. He didn't come to show us how bad we are. The law did that. He didn't come to condemn us, to accuse us, or to make us feel bad, guilty, ashamed. He didn't, he didn't come for that. He came to save us. Right? He came to save us. Verse 18, he that believes on him is not condemned. Is that you? But he that believes not is condemned already. 
because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now the word condemned means guilty. It means, you know, judged and found guilty. And of course what follows is if you're guilty, you should be punished. You should be sentenced and punished. But if you believe on him, you're not found guilty. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> Whew. You're not found guilty. If you don't believe on him, you are. You are found guilty. You are condemned. Verse 19. This is the condemnation that lights come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Ignorance is not the biggest problem on the planet. I used to think that when I first started in the ministry, that the biggest problem is that people just didn't know about God and people didn't know about Jesus and, and they didn't know the truth. They didn't know the gospel. And that is a big problem. Don't get me wrong, but it's not the biggest problem because the truth is millions of people have seen something about God and they have heard something about God and they didn't want it. That's the problem. That's the problem. When Jesus was manifested in the flesh, God became man. He came into his own and what happened? They didn't receive him. The elders of his people, the spiritual elders, and, and the, you know, the, many of the people that went to the synagogues, they saw him, they heard him, and they hated him. Right. Which means they saw God and heard God and hated God. So it's not true that everybody that sees and hears something about God and the truth is going to love it and receive it. Aren't you glad you're one of the smart ones? Yes. <laughs> Do you love him? Yes. Do you believe on him? Yes. Then you're not guilty. Yes. Not guilty. Yes. Not guilty. Yes. <laughs> I can almost hear some of our visitors say, boy, y'all sure are excitable. Yeah. yeah. Amen. Don't expect us to calm down. <laughs> the truth will make you free. The truth will make you free. No, you just need to get excited with us. John 8, turn over there if you would. John the 8th chapter is the account to where they caught this woman, apparently in the bedroom with a man she wasn't married to. They accused her of adultery and drug her out publicly in front of Jesus, threw her down in front of the Jesus and the people he was speaking to and said, Moses in the law says, Stoner, what do you say? And uh, in John 8 and 10, after Jesus had told them, you know, he that's without sin among you, let him cast the first stone, and they all left. And Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman. He said to her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Very important use of word here. Accusers. Did you know the devil is called the accuser of the brethren? Revelation says so. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. Accusing you of what? Accusing you of being guilty. Accusing you of, you know, that you deserve punishment. This was her. They're accusing her of sin. Telling that she is to be blamed and should be ashamed and deserves punishment. And Jesus says, where's your accusers at? Has no man condemned you? She was glad to say, verse 11, no man, Lord. See, just a few moments ago, she thinks for sure she's about to die. Yeah. And now everybody with the rocks is gone. And Jesus said to her, oh, friends, can you hear the master? Yeah. What did he say? Yeah. Neither do I condemn you. Jesus didn't come 
to condemn us. Did he? Now, did he tell her that what she did was okay? No, he didn't. In fact, he called it sin, didn't he? And he said, don't do it again. But he said, I'm not condemning you. I'm not condemning you. Neither do I condemn you. I'm not accusing you. Now, we need mind renewal because centuries of religion has painted a picture of a mad, judgmental God. Hasn't it? And much of what has been preached is sin consciousness. You know, how bad we are. How short we've fallen. How, how messed up we are. You know, how unworthy we are. It's been preached that we can be saved from hell. But that's not the whole gospel. I said that's not the whole gospel. We are much more than forgiven. We are much more than saved from hell. Now thank God for being saved from hell. I'm not diminishing that. But we're not just forgiven. We're made righteous. Hallelujah. We're not just unworthy worms that don't have to go to hell. He forgave us and 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 he cleansed us from all unrighteousness and made us righteous with his own righteousness so that we can, if we'll believe it and accept it, we can stand before the presence of the most pure Holy One in the universe without shame, without embarrassment, without the sense of unworthiness. That hasn't been preached enough. That hasn't been emphasized enough. So many of our songs in the churches have been full of unworthiness. Unworthiness. And because people have heard it all their life, they think they associate it with the Bible. But there, there's a lot of hymns. that the ver, Maybe the chorus is good and verse 1 is good. But verse 2, 3, and 4 is absolute unbelief and contrary to half the New Testament. That's right. <laughs> and there's a lot of songs that half the chorus is good and the other half is terrible. But people haven't known the word enough to discern it and to recognize it. And there are people who just get, get huffy about it. If you, if you say anything uh, less than you know, glowing review about their song. I had a lady come to me one time upset after I spoke and she said, uh-uh, uh-uh. I said, what? She said, well, it's like the song says. I said, huh? <laughs> the scriptures we were reading had messed up her song. <laughs> and she was really unhappy about it. <laughs> but that's a song we need to lose, Right? I don't care if grandma sang it for 50 years. If it's contrary to the word. Somebody say it's out of here. It's out of here. It's out of here. He said neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Reckon what he'd say to you today. Is he not the same yesterday, today and forever? Isn't he, is he no respecter of persons? So what would he say to you? I don't care what kind of grievous failure or sin you may have fallen into, what would he say to you? I don't condemn you. Go and, and don't do it anymore. Right? Live free. Hmm? Live free. He'd tell you, I didn't come to condemn you. I didn't come to tell you how bad you are. I came to save you. Clean you up. Make you righteous. Make you holy. I came to do what you could never do on your own. Since you could never get it, I got it for you. <laughs> and just gave it to you. Just receive it. Can you say thank you, Lord? Thank you. Romans, the eighth chapter. Romans 8, verse 1. 
Romans 8, 1 says, there is, that's Romans 8, verse 1 says, there is therefore, now no, how much? None. No condemnation. What is condemnation? That's guilt. There's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Keep reading. For, you ought to say this out loud, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. What is the law of sin and death? It's the law that if you sin, you die. It's a law. It happens to everything. The Lord, the Lord didn't tell us, you know, and God didn't give the commandments, and the Lord didn't tell us to, to not sin because he wants to spoil your fun. Sin will kill you. Doesn't mean if you do something that's sin that you just fall physically dead immediately any more than Adam and Eve fell physically dead the moment they sinned. But they did die. I said they did die. And death began working in them and took hundreds of years but their bodies died too because death started working in them back there then. When you sin, part of you dies. Different parts, different ways. But there's something greater than the law of sin and death. It is the, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. You ought to say it again. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Glory to God. Somebody say glory to God. Glory to God. Go with me, please, to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. You said you're believing with me this morning, right? You're believing not to hear from me, hmm? but to hear from him. Ephesians 6. I want you to notice a phrase that we, we should... Uh, Get more light on today. 6 and 10. Ephesians 6 and 10. He said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Now that's not just being strong in yourself. I don't care how strong you think you are spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, financially, whatever. I assure you you have a breaking point. Hmm? I don't care who you are, who you think you are, there is a point where your strength runs out. I mean out. And you're done. But there's somebody in you. Glory to God. Uh, the greater one who does not run out. He does not get weary. He does not get tired. The one in me never gets tired. There's somebody other than me in me. Different person. Right? And because of his empowering me and quickening me and enabling me, if I run out, that doesn't have to be the end. I can tap in to him. Amen. He can quicken me. You know, Jesus talking about, I'm going to pray the Father. He's going to send you another comforter. And the Amplified brings out the sevenfold meaning of, of those names. And, and one of the uh, names given is standby. Amen. You know, he's the comforter. He's the counselor and, and strengthener. Among other things, he's the standby. Talking about the Holy Spirit. When I think about standby, I'm a, uh, I'm a country boy from Mississippi, and um, we grew up around hot rods. I think about four barrels. <laughs> Anybody know what a four-barrel 
carburetor is. <laughs> Where I grew up, we thought Dukes of Hazard was a documentary. <laughs> Because that's how we lived. I mean, we, no joke. I knew guys that did the same thing with their cars. Instead of a Charger, it was a Super B. But same kind of thing. Outrunning the law, same kind of stuff. <laughs> Didn't always end well, though. It wasn't in the movies. Real life's different from the movies. But uh, a four barrel is, you know, you're running on the, the front two barrels most of the time. But, you know, if you're, if you're leaving the light real hard, <laughs> and this Mustang or Camaro or whatever is starting to pull on you a little bit, you got some standby. Yep. <laughs> Put your foot on in it. Get heavy into those back two barrels. <laughs> and then all this extra power comes in. Because you're putting all that extra fuel and air through that engine. Well, you got some standby in you. Do you know you do? You got the greater one inside you. And when it looks like you're falling behind and the enemy's pulling ahead of you, you just need to put your foot on into it. Come on, are you listening? Because the greater one can and will quicken you and enable you to do beyond what you could do. On your own. Amen. Do you believe it, saints? Yes. Read it again. What did he say? Be strong. Be strong how? In the Lord. Be strong how? In the, in the Lord, in the power of his might. That's beyond yours and mine. Keep reading. Put on the whole armor of God. Now, who's supposed to do that? The understood subject is you. You put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Wiles has to do with trickery, subtlety, deception. The devil doesn't come to the front door with a red suit on and a pitchfork. That's too obvious. <laughs> one, of, one of his best tricks is convincing most of the world he doesn't even exist. And he's always trying to come in the back door through the window some way where you don't notice him. You don't realize it's him. You weren't expecting it. And that's his mode of operation. But there is armor that we have that protects us from his tricks and schemes. Verse 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's not our problem. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness and high places, spiritual issues, enemy. Verse 13, wherefore, he says it again, take unto you the whole armor of God. Do we have armor, saints? Yes. Do we need armor? Yes. We do. We've got an enemy arrayed against us. And there are, it's a spiritual enemy. Just because when you say spirit, that doesn't mean imaginary. <laughs> right? Spirit doesn't mean imaginary. Spirit is real. You are a spirit. If you lost your body right now, you'd still be you. You'd still exist. You're a spirit. Well, angels are spirits. Demons are spirit. God is spirit. And we have spiritual enemies. And because of our enemies, we need protection. We need armor, and thank God we have armor. The armor of God. Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand. To withstand. Withstand what? Well, the, the attack from the enemy. Verse 14. Stand therefore. Having your loins girt about with truth. Do you need protection? Yes, sir. What's going to protect you, uh, your loins? Truth. truth. And what? Having on the breastplate 
of righteousness. Is there a breastplate of righteousness? Who's supposed to put it on? He tells us twice that we are to put it on. We're to put on all the armor of God. Now there's been some things said about this, but I still think by and large many Christians don't really understand. It's not real to them. And yet this is real. We're talking about righteousness. Well, here righteousness is described as a breastplate. As something that we should put on. Why do we need to put it on? Well, obviously, somebody's trying to stab us. Somebody's trying to spear us. Aren't they? The enemy is trying to to pierce us, to penetrate us, to hurt us. And we need something that will stop his weapon. That instead of just piercing into us, piercing our heart, piercing our lungs, piercing our vital organs, it just hits something, clink, (laughs) scrape. (laughs) You're not that tough by yourself, but the Lord's given us something to put on. That will make our vitals safe. It's called the breastplate of righteousness. Oh, somebody say, I have a breastplate of righteousness. Let me read to you from Vines and Thayer's definitions, explanations of these words. What is this breastplate? Vine says this breastplate consisted of two parts, protecting the body on both sides from the neck to the middle. Thayer said from the neck to the navel, covering the ribs, covering everything that the ribs cover, front and back. You like the sound of this or not? Front and back. Breastplate. Thank you, Lord. How are we to understand this? Go with me to the book of Romans, please. The fifth chapter. You're believing with me for light and revelation on this, right? Romans 5 and 1. says, therefore, being justified by faith, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Keep reading. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Thank you, Lord. Let me keep reading for a couple of verses here. Verse 3, not only so, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation works patience, patience experience, experience hope. Hope makes not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. Now skip on down to verse uh, um, let's see if we had time the ideal thing would be to read all of chapter 5 and 6 and 7 and 8. That's why I'm pausing, because I, I got to pick the right ones. Look down in verse 17, chapter 5. Verse 17, it says, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the what? Yes. Gift of righteousness shall do what? Reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Now we're going to talk about that more as the Lord helps us. Maybe not today, but can you come back? I hope you can. Uh, Skip over to the seventh chapter. Knowing that there's a lot of good material between where you were and there. The seventh chapter. Verse uh, 10. 
Let's see. Back up a couple of verses. Back up to eight. He said, sin, let's just stop right here. Is there a law of sin and what? Death. But there's something bigger than that. It's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. He said, sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence for without the law, sin was dead. Keep reading. For I was alive. Without the law once or at one time. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. The law of sin and death. Keep reading. The commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Keep reading. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me, killed me. How did it kill you? Now see, in in, in Ephesians, we're looking at armor. We're talking about an enemy that's attacking. What's the enemy want to do? He wants to kill you. He doesn't just want to bother you. He wants to kill you. And he he uses, uh, uh, to paint a graphic picture, the armament of soldiers of the day. That there were, uh, in fact, the Bible talks about, don't turn there, but 2 Corinthians 6, 7 in the Amplified, put that on the screen for us, 2 Corinthians 6, 7 in the Amplified. He says, speaking the, the word of truth in the power of God with the weapons, plural, of righteousness for the right hand to attack and the left hand to defend. We have weapons of righteousness. They're not imaginary. This is not just figurative speech. This is the thing we, we got to get, you know, people, they hear some of these things, they hear spirit, they think imaginary, just, just graphic, just figurative. No, these things are real. Is sin real? Is your enemy real? Is he trying to kill you real? Then the armor's real. The protection is real. The righteousness is real. It's real and it can stop that piercing weapon from hurting you. Do you believe it? If you don't have it on, you're vulnerable. Easily pierced. Easily hurt. Look in 2 Corinthians 10. 2 Corinthians 10 and the fourth verse. Said out loud, putting on the breastplate of righteousness. What does that breastplate do for you? It covers you from your neck to your navel, both sides. What does that do for you? Well, it's going to prevent an arrow or a spear or a blade, a sword or a dagger, right? from piercing you and damaging one of your vital organs. Right? That's why they made these pieces. They were cumbersome. They were heavy. They were uncomfortable. They were hot. But hey, it's better than having an arrow in your heart. Right? He said the weapons... Well, let's back up uh, to verse 3. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Does this phrase sound familiar from Romans 8? He talked about walking in the spirit instead of walking in the flesh. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. You have to keep reminding yourself of that. Uh, My problem is not flesh and blood. I say, yeah, yeah it is. And his name is Joe. Yeah, it is, and her name is Susie. No, no, no. I, you say, yeah, yeah, you don't know Joe. Well, listen, I don't know Joe, but I assure you, if Joe would get saved and get full of the Holy Spirit and quit yielding to the enemy, he could be your best buddy. Hmm? He's not your real problem. 
It's whatever he's yielding to. Hmm? That's your real enemy. Husbands and wives, are you awake? Husbands and wives, are you awake? Get this one thing and it can absolutely slam the door in the devil's faith in, face in your marriage. Your spouse is not your problem. Say la. Ladies, your husband is not your problem. Hmm? Men, your wife is not your problem. The devil will do his best to convince you they are. They are the thorn in your side. They are your problem. Mm -mm. If we could just have enough under spiritual sense, for lack of a better word, to realize we're not each other's problem. The devil's been playing us and he's been playing us off each other. If we would join forces against him, we would get free. We would stop this strife and this junk and shut it down. Say it out loud. Somebody needs to say it out loud. My spouse is not my enemy. The devil is our enemy. See, we, we don't war against flesh and blood, do we? Flesh and blood's not our problem. It's the enemy. It's, it's the spiritual forces behind it. He said, verse 4, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty. Do we have weapons? We got weapons. Are they real? They're real. And they're powerful, mighty, through God. We don't have to be whooped. We don't have to be defeated. We don't have to be conquered. We don't have to be overcome. We can win again and again. Just win. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now keep going. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Amen. Here is a revelation of the enemy's weapons. Why do you need a helmet of salvation? Why do you need loins girt? With truth. Why do you need a breastplate of righteousness? Because of fiery thought darts, fiery imagination arrows. These are real. How many would acknowledge thoughts are real? Can thoughts affect you? You can be having a great day, enjoying life. And one thought come across your mind and take your joy just like that and peace and just flop down in the chair and feel sorry for yourself if you yield to it. But if you had your helmet on, okay, somebody wake up in here. If, if you had your helmet on, it just go ding. <laughs> and you'd say, I ain't letting that in. That's not raining on my parade. Hmm? <laughs> These thoughts are spiritual. They're accompanied with feelings. And they are very real. They're very real. And if you let them in, they can hurt you. I said they can hurt you. If you let them in, they can penetrate you deep. They can wound you down inside until you grieve and sorrow and yield to death. Many people are incapacitated. I'm talking about church going people. Incapacitated with grief, anger, hurt, 
won't leave the house for days, no longer fellowship with different people. Why? Something got in. I said something got in. Something pierced them. It pierced their heart and their soul. It pierced their mind. It got in. They didn't have their armor on. They didn't have the breastplate of righteousness on. They didn't. And so they were easy target, easy mark. When it came, it just went right in and hurt them. I don't want to be an easy mark, do you? I don't want to be easily hurt, easily defeated. How many like this idea of stuff just bouncing off of you, just, just ricocheting off of you? You like that? Anybody like that? Even if the devil fires his big one, huh? his big one, and it hits, and it explodes, he can't see anything for the dust. And when it, when it clears, you're standing there going, tink, tink, no problem. Tink, tink. Say, man, you got to get you one of these. <laughs> this is no ordinary gear right here. This is God armor. God armor. Armor made, not, not made in the U.S. or China. Made by God. Made by God. Made by God. The armor of God. And it is absolutely uncrushable, impenetrable. And it protects my heart. What the Bible calls your reins. Your insides, your soul, there's a helmet of salvation for your mind, right? Say it out loud, I'm not an easy mark. I'm not easily hurt. I'm not easily defeated. I'm protected. Come on, show me. Ding, ding, ding. I'm protected. I got major, major coverage here. Right? Front and the back. Front and the back. <laughs> That's what you need. People try to stab you in the back, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> they said, did you see that trying to stab you in the back? You know, I heard a little dink. I, is that what was going on? <laughs> Instead of what? Instead of folding... Like a wet noodle going, after all I did for them, I just can't believe it. I need to take a sick day and just stay at the house. And, oh, God, why'd you let this happen to me? And if you'd listen, he'd say, stand up. What do you mean, why'd I let this? Why didn't you put your armor on? I told you to put your armor on. Did you know we're supposed to endure hardness as good soldiers? Yes. 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 No. Quit being such little whiny babies. <laughs> so easily hurt. So easily offended. So easily upset. No. Things should just bounce off of us. Just bounce off of us. Glory to God. Because we are completely covered. Having taken to ourselves, having put on ourselves the whole armor of God. Glory to God. Boy, the time is clipped by. At least it has for me. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to give you some more. You got time? Or? Go to uh, Luke, 22nd chapter. I want to I just look at an example or two of what we're talking about here. Luke 22. Everyone who has been bold, who has been confident in the things of God, has learned the truths we're talking about today. They have overcome guilt 
shame, condemnation, haven't they? And learned how to put on this breastplate of righteousness that we're talking about. Elsewise, your confidence will be completely eroded. I can't stand up before you today and, you know, lift my head up, speak boldly, and confidently, believe God would use me, believe God would speak through me if I'm thinking about every mistake I ever made. Huh? Any and every failure. If I dwell on that, see, people think that's being humble. It's being dumb, actually. It's got nothing to do with humility. People think that's, that's humility, though, that, you know, oh, I'm, you know, I, I've, I've missed it in so many ways. I've come short so many times. Well, we already knew that. <laughs> All of us in the same boat, right? And talking it will not help you. You know what talking it is doing? It's pulling off your armor and laying it aside saying, no, I'm not righteous. There's none righteous. No, not one. And certainly not me. People said, that's a scripture. Yeah, but there's other scriptures that go with it. <laughs> Part of it. It's one of those things we're talking about. Part of it is. No. There's none righteous in themselves and from their own works and endeavors, but he has made us. He gave us this armor. If I dwelt on my mistakes, my failures enough, I might not even come out this morning. Right? I may just stay at the house and go, you know, y'all need to get somebody else. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not fit to do this. Huh? Or if I did drag myself out, I'd have no confidence. I'd say, well, you know, y'all look at it. Well, you probably already know it. In fact, I imagine every one of y'all could do better than what I'm doing right now. In fact, let's just go home. Let's just... And some foolish people say, look how humble he is. We got the humblest little preacher you ever saw. You got to, you'd have a defeated preacher with arrows sticking out on all sides, nursing hurts, bleeding from front and back. <laughs> I'm so hurt. I'm so bad. You don't want to hear about how hurt I am. That ain't going to help you. Huh? No, you need to be built up. You need to be fed. You need to be strengthened. You need to put your armor on. You need to be strong and overcome. Hallelujah. <laughs> See, people think it's just part of life and that everybody's supposed to just baby each other when they get shot, when they get hurt. <laughs> right? Right? You go, oh, they hurt me. And people go, let me see, let me see, let me see. Ooh, that's bad, that's deep, that's deep. Bless your heart. Ain't it bad? Why'd they shoot you? I can't believe they shot you. That's just awful. People, people are just shooting everybody nowadays. Everybody just shooting everybody else. It's awful. What's the world coming to? Instead, we should say, why didn't you have your armor on? Well, how'd you get shot in the first place? Right? <laughs> Just because they shoot at you doesn't mean you have to get shot. Right? Because we got weapons. We got armor. <laughs> in Luke 22, in Luke 22, before Jesus went to the cross, he told Peter this. Luke 22 and 31. The Lord said to him, Simon, 
Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you. Now, to have is in italic, so it wasn't in the original. He, he's desired you to what? That he may sift you as wheat, that he may take you apart. He has focused on you. The devil doesn't know everything. He does not. But being a spirit being and being around as long as he has, he can see some things that people can't see. No doubt he could see God was preparing Peter for great things. And he could see the hand of the Lord on him. Well, it's easier to crush an acorn than it is an oak tree. Right? Take him out now before he ever gets started. He's a mean devil. Do you know this? Oh, he's a murderer. He's a murderer at heart. He's not trying to hurt you. He's trying to take you out. He'll settle for hurting you if that's all he can do at the moment. But he's got plans for bigger things. Satan has desired to, to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Verse 32. But I have prayed for you. Glory to God. That your faith fail not. Did you know faith is part of this armor? It's the shield. Isn't it? How many understand, man, you're covered. You got that breastplate on, front and back. Then you got the shield in front of that. (laughs) It ought not get through. When you're converted, not if, when you get straightened out, when you get converted, strengthen your brethren, help them. Well, what happened? What happened immediately after that? They, they came and took Jesus away. Skip on down to verse uh, 60 or so. And uh, Peter did deny that he knew the Lord, even though he had adamantly told Jesus no way he would ever deny him. He would uh, die with him. And he meant to. When it all started going down, he whips out his blade and starts fighting, slicing off ears. Hallelujah. Right? Yeah. He knows he's not a soldier. When you start attacking trained soldiers, you're about to die, right? I mean, he knew that. And he planned on that. What he didn't plan on was Jesus letting them take him. And when that happened and Jesus told him, put up your sword, he didn't know what to do. And they all, none of them knew what to do. They ran. And now they're standing out there and they're looking for somebody else to take out two and they ask him and he says I don't know him Uh uh-uh scared scared and bewildered and confused I don't know him and uh, about verse 60 I guess we said Peter said man I don't know what you say and immediately while he yet spoke the cock crew and the Lord turned and looked at Peter wow now I guess there was some distance between them I don't know if Jesus could even hear what Peter and these guys were saying, but he knew it in his spirit, and he turned and looked at him. And uh, Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said before the cock crow, you'll deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. What happened? His soul was pierced. Can you see this? He is crying. He's hurting, isn't he? He did what he adamantly affirmed he would never do. You ever been there? Don't raise a hand. (laughs) Failing the one you love. Going back on your word. Yielding and doing things you said you would never do. What's the result of that? The wages of sin is death. He, he, said, he said that sin killed me. It slew me. Romans 7 said. That's like, a, that's like a missile of some type piercing into your vitals and killing you. He's out there. 
crying his eyes out. He's hurting. Do you believe he's hurting on the inside? He's hurting. This, this kind of pain goes beyond physical pain, doesn't it? Because it's real. Just like you can be pierced with a knife in your body, you can be pierced with something in your spirit. It's not imaginary. It's real. It's real. And he is a broken man. He's a broken man. But something happened. Jesus was raised from the dead. Peter saw him with the others when they're eating bread and fish together. Jesus pulls him aside and says, Peter, do you love me? (laughs) He said, yes. How many think he's not as brass and bold as he was last time? (laughs) And yet he still loves the Lord. He said, feed my lambs. Oh, friend, don't let that phrase get by you. Why would Jesus ask you to feed his lambs if you're done and got no place with him anymore? Huh? Come on, are y'all listening? The head of the church is asking you to do something. That means he's giving you a place. You're going to be involved with him. You're going to be in the ministry with him. He says it again. He says it again. And something happened because by the day of Pentecost, Peter steps out and preaches not like a man who's failed God. He preaches not like somebody who's denied their Lord. He preaches like somebody who's never made a mistake. He preaches like somebody who's never failed. He preaches like a righteous man. Because he is. He is. He's gotten a hold of the fact that in spite of his failures and his sin, he is forgiven. And not just forgiven, he's cleansed. And he's got the breastplate of righteousness on. And any time that the enemy comes and try to stab him with his failure and how he failed the Lord and messed up and just goes, scrape. Because he says, I'm forgiven, I'm cleansed, and it doesn't get in. Paul killed saints. He tracked them down to their homes. He drug them out of their houses. He held the clothes while they stoned Stephen. He was a bad man, wasn't he? And yet, who's preaching about we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ? It's him. I said, it's him. Who told us about the breastplate of righteousness? He did. He's the one who found out about it. He had to put it on or he would have never overcome the guilt and the shame of all the stuff he had done. And unless and until you can overcome that guilt and shame, you will never be bold in God. You'll never be confident. You'll never stand up. You'll never step out. Go to 1 John 3, please, in closing. 1 John 3, say it out loud, I have the mighty breastplate of righteousness. Glory to God. You got it on? Let me me tell you about this. Actually, don't take it off. Okay, sleep in it. Are y'all with me? Sleep in this thing. It's comfortable. It won't bother you. Sleep in it. Because the enemy try to shoot you at night. Won't he? Just sneak up by your bed. He's a sorry cuss. Now, now how does he try to stab you? Casting down imaginations. Bringing into captivity every thought. Hmm? Because the thoughts will come. You did this. You didn't do that. Accusations. It's trying to get in. Trying to get into what? To hurt you. So that you get hurt. You get offended, you get mad, you get upset, you get grieved. In 1 John 3, 1 John 3, over in verse uh, 20. If our heart does what? 
condemns us. What's condemn? Guilty. Makes us feel guilty and ashamed. If our heart condemns us, that's not the same thing as God condemning us. Actually, we, we, we need to correct a phrase. You ever heard somebody go to church and maybe something was preached on or talked about and people say, boy, you know, well, the Holy, really, Holy Spirit really condemned me about some things. That's incorrect language. That's not true. He may have convicted you. That, that can also be said, he, he convinced you of the truth of what's right and wrong. And in the light of seeing what's good and right, if you see that you're wrong, your own heart will condemn you. But that's not him condemning you. Because he didn't come into the world to condemn the world. Did he? God's not condemning you. No matter what you've done, he's not condemning you. He's not saying what you did is okay. But he's not condemning you over it. If our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. No need trying to hide it or run from him, run to him. Verse 21, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then, and we might say it only then, have we confidence toward God? How did Peter get confidence toward God? He got to the place where his heart didn't condemn him anymore about his past mistakes. How did Paul get to the place where he could boldly preach the gospel to the known world after having killed Christians and done the things that he did. He obviously got to the place where his heart didn't condemn him anymore. There's only one thing, only one thing that can cleanse a guilty conscience. It is faith in the blood of the Lamb. Do you believe it, saints? It's, it, the blood of the Lamb is power not just to forgive you but to cleanse your conscience to rid you of a guilty shameful conscience if you believe it and receive it then you just put on the breastplate of righteousness and if your heart's not condemning you what happens to you what happens to you the righteous are bold as a lion huh Jesus, did he ever run from the devil? Was he ever scared of a disease or a, a storm? Never, never. Why? Because he's walking as a righteous man. He has no guilt. He has no shame. Somebody say, yeah, but that's Jesus and I've missed it. We already know that. Quit talking about it. He gave you his righteousness so you could be bold like him. If our heart doesn't condemn us, then we have confidence. Somebody say confidence, confidence, confidence toward God. And what else? Verse 22, and whatever we ask, we get it. Because <laughs> we, we pray differently. We don't come in begging, God, if it's your will. We don't know. We hope so. We know we're unworthy. But, you know, Whatever. If you could see some way, somehow. Like one fellow's prayed one time, by some hook or crook. <laughs> no. What did the Bible say? Let us therefore come boldly. That's not arrogantly, but, but yet it's confidently. Confidently before the throne of grace. Knowing we got a right to be there. Knowing we don't have to grovel and beg because we got nothing to be ashamed of. Because our sins really are washed away. And the righteousness of God has been given to us. Whatever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and we do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Our heart's not bothering us. Our conscience is clear and our confidence is strong. Stand on your feet.